All right, hopefully the screen is visible to everyone. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of my work on trying to integrate spatial structure and in particular the managerial aspect we have over our livestock in the form of honeybees in underpinning the spatial structure of their population and by virtue the ecological and evolutionary effects that has on their parasites. Really the defining theme of this uh, 20 minute half an hour talk is going to be bees in space um, illustrated here by this little cartoon um, and understanding really how bees move through space and where we put them in space and what that means for their infectious diseases, their parasites and their pathogens, how we might quantitatively um, begin to understand some of those processes in helping beekeepers maintain their livestock, maintain a healthy agroecological environment, keep food prices low and maintain a species that has a lot of cultural um, worth as well. People care very much about saving these little critters as they go about their business. Just before I get into the meat of the research, just a shout out to the funders and the institutions that have underpinned either work I'm going to be talking about and um, that is already completed or current work that's ongoing all on this theme. The four institutions I've worked at there, University of Georgia, my current one, Exeter, Berkeley and Emory, my former institutions, and then much of this work was funded by NER, the BBSRC, and the National Institutes of Health over here in the US. I also quickly want to highlight all my fantastic uh, former supervisors and co-authors that underpinned this work. Uh, Mike Boots, now at UC Berkeley, um, and Lena Wilfert, now at University of Ulm in Germany, my former PhD supervisors. Carly Rosings was just starting as an assistant professor at University of Guelph up in Canada, who co-authored uh, much of this work with me. Jennifer Berry and Keith Delaplane, who are master beekeepers and Keith is professor of uh, honeybee biology here at University of Georgia. Barry Brose, now at University of Washington. Andrew White at Harriet Watt. And Yap Darud at Emory. All of these people uh, underpin most of the work I'm talking about today. So I'm going to break this talk down really into three sections and the last two a little bit more closely related to each other. I'm going to talk a little bit about the theoretical underpinning and our current understanding of how spatial ecology determines um, evolutionary strategies that parasites optimize and how space can constrain how deadly parasites are selected to become. I'm then going to move into applying that to my personal pet system of honeybees and understand how they're changing spatial ecology across different scales, might influence pathogen spread, and finally whether or not we can pick up signatures of selection or at least test predictions of how we might have expected these parasites and pathogens to have evolved in bees in the face of rapidly changing spatial ecology as a consequence of changes in the broader agroecological system with the intensification of farming, especially here in the United States. So to start off, we're going to talk a little bit about some work that I just submitted that moves, um, moves on from a rich body of theory examining how spatial ecology determines the evolution of parasites. And at the core of much of this is a kind of fundamental question in parasite and pathogen evolutionary ecology, which is what makes parasites deadly. And I don't mean this in approximate sense. I mean this in an ultimate evolutionary sense in that killing your host is always inherently maladaptive. If one of us was infected with a parasite or pathogen and we were to die, for most pathogens that also spells the end of their existence as the host on which they rely to live has kicked the bucket and so they follow suit quickly. And this has been a kind of long posed question in the evolution of infectious diseases is what maintains virulence? Why aren't pathogens and parasites continually being selected to evolve towards commensalism or even mutualism in order to escape this cost of killing their host. And while there's a lot of understood mechanisms that underpin the maintenance of virulence, why it remains worthwhile for certain pathogens to be deadly, that being competition, generalism, vectoring, strategies or even environmental persistence. Another one is spatial structure. 
So parasites purchase transmission at the cost of virulence. This has kind of been the overarching paradigm for our understanding of why virulence, that's kind of pathogen deadliness, is maintained. And that's the strains of uh, parasites can increase their virulence and that affords them higher rates of transmission. In the simplest terms, this can be really just understood as a replication rate. A bacterial strain that reproduces twice as fast in a host will be more likely to be passed on simply because of the propagule pressure coming out of that host. There's more complicated underpinnings there, but I think conceptually, that's by far the easiest way to understand it. Evolution then seeks to optimize this transmission um, and virulence along a trade-off. Uh, traditionally, we understand this as maximizing R0, which is a measure of a parasite or pathogen fitness. I don't, I believe, in the year 2020 have to spend any time introducing this parameter. It has seen its fair share of media coverage in the last six months. Um, and a shout out to the originators of this entire system of thinking. Um, great papers by Anderson and May in the 80s with Bob May having recently um, passed away, as some of you may know. Critically, we understand that spatial structure plays a role in maintaining lower virulence evolutionary optima. So to turn that on its head, we know that when we mix spatially structured systems and we remove some of the spatial structuring, we typically see evolution towards more virulent and so more deadly forms. The optimum virulence changes and it is within our interests in the evolutionary and ecological management of burdensome diseases to try and maintain some spatial structure in order to bias them towards maintaining a less deadly evolutionary optima. As a rich body of theory, understanding this and a lot of it centers around this concept of what we term self-shading. And this is the more proximate mechanism by our reckoning, uh, mine, my supervisors, and some other people that work in this field, by which space limits um, virulence and punishes parasites or pathogens who try and spread too quickly um, and are too deadly. And here's a quotation from a paper that I currently have under review, which I think best explains this. In the parasites with high transmission rates, self-shade due to genetic correlations and ecological correlations, whereby the genetic correlations are that clustered related parasite strains compete for susceptible individuals. That is in a very structured um, system where transmission is mostly local um, parasites are often competing with clones of themselves or highly related individuals for the same resources and that reduces competition effectively through kin selection and maintains a lower virulence. Similarly, this can only happen um, through ecological correlations that shade whereby infected individuals typically cluster around each other and block transmission. If the entirety of a population is all infected with a certain pathogen, then there are no new susceptibles to infect, and that reduces that um, R or R naught number, it reduces pathogen fitness, and so it can select for a lower degree of transmission and by virtue um, the benefits of being less virulent. I'm not the first to state that, um, but I do prefer using my own words. Beyond just theory, this has been demonstrated a couple of times very elegantly empirically. Um, perhaps most famously by Ben Kerr in a 2006 Nature paper, of which there's a small excerpt here, where he controlled migration rates between bacterial populations, effectively um, increasing or decreasing the degree of spatial structuring of the system, and compared the survival or the winning strategy in terms of a prudent bacteriophage, a bacteria virus, or a rapacious phage whereby the prudent phage is far less virulent, but also has a lower transmission rate compared to the rapacious phage, which is very virulent, kills its hosts quickly, tends to drive local populations to extinction, that spreads very rapidly. And he effectively showed um, through a bunch of these laboratory microcosm experiments that higher degrees of spatial structure promote the survival of the prudent phage and the extinction of the rapacious phage but as we increase mixing in the system, the rapacious phage often wins. And this was framed in his case in a tragedy of the commons theoretical framework. Similarly, this was shown in a larger organism in Plodia interpunctella with their granulosis virus, a system that some of my PhD work on, whereby manipulating the viscosity of the food media in which they live, you can limit their dispersal 
this alters spatial structure and as food becomes more viscous, spatial structure increases and the infectivity of the virus um, drops as it's selected to become less virulent and less infectious. There's been huge amounts of effort to model these processes. Um, tractable modeling of evolution is quite difficult to do in a spatial manner. Um, people much smarter than me have really laid the path and the uh, groundwork for this. Um, one approach, which I'm going to talk about a little bit now, was to track so-called pairs using pair approximations of sites. And the original paper that um, introduces these pair approximations is, is shown on the screen there, um, coming out of a journal of Progress of Theoretical Physics. Not a journal I anticipated reading as a grad student, but there we go. Uh, in 1992, excellent year, many great things came out of uh, 1992, I believe. The principle of pair approximations is that say we have a spatially structured population shown on the left here as a lattice where we have um, two plants let's say the blue ones are infected and the black ones are uninfected without acknowledging spatial structure we would model, model these populations of this population rather as having six out of 16 um, infected plants and 10 out of 16 susceptible plants the pair approximations begin to capture some of the spatial structuring by also considering each um, pair of individuals. So here I have highlighted a susceptible infectious pair, and this is the major route by which local transmission can occur of pathogens. And so in this case, we see um, only one incidence of a pair of infected individuals next to each other, demonstrating the kind of ecological correlation, the shading that I mentioned earlier. If we rearrange the um, population such that the proportions of individuals have remained the same but the spatial structure is different, we can see that the number of pairs has changed to five uh, unique pairs of infected individuals being next to each other, vastly increasing the capacity for this self-shading mechanism to select for lower virulence due to kin selection and this likelihood of two infected individuals being next to each other and consequently competing for a much reduced smaller pool of susceptibles around them. In this way, we hope to capture some of the most coarse aspects of spatial structuring of populations in determining the ecology and consequently the evolution. Um, and so this pair approximation method has been applied quite widely in understanding the constraint, the evolutionary constraint of virulence. And once we have ecology, which comes from these pair approximations, we can layer on top of that an adaptive dynamics framework. Um, if anyone wants to look that up, I don't know how frequently some quantitative ecologists run into the evolutionary sphere. Um, here's the paper that I've always found most interesting. For those of you that might have read it, here is a prompting figure, kind of the main figure from that Garrett et al paper, demonstrating uh, the core of this adaptive dynamics framework, where we look for continuously stable, evolutionarily stable, uh, singular strategies, that's B here, and use them to determine what the ecology state should be the optimum strategy for an uh, evolving individual. This has been widely used to um, demonstrate that virulence should evolve to be lower here in a fully local system on the far left compared to a maximizing virulence um, on the far right with an intermediate virulence with a small degree of mixing here from a 2007 paper from Kamos Zakin Boots. I followed on top of this uh, recently to test some of the not particularly realistic biological assumptions that have underpinned this kind of body of very fruitful theory looking at the consequences of mixing for pathogens. Um, we can define a whole bunch of ecological parameters, just running through them here. Um, it's not, not a vast number of things that have to be specified, but critically we can look at natural mortality versus pathogenic mortality transmission and the mixing parameters. Uh, this proportion of global reproduction and transmission, which can effectively be reimagined as host versus parasite dispersal. We can make some basic statements about the system. This just uh, illustrates the behavior of the pair approximations. And from that, we can build an ordinary system of differential equations that describes the ecology of the system. Here, just one excerpt. This is written out in what I call a biologist form. 
where each term represents a discrete bio biological process rather than being factored out. And we can see the very first term there being an example of global reproduction, so reproduction from a non-neighbouring um, site on the lattice into a, an empty site that is adjacent to an infected individual, creating a susceptible infected pair, which then allows for um, local transmission and kind of those susceptible infected pairs underpin a lot of the evolutionary consequences we see here. Once we establish a system like this, we can come up with an inversion criteria, this um, lambda ji, which shows uh, when um, lambda is above zero, so positive, um, that is a mutant strain j can displace a native strain i. Um, the left hand side of this equation is the kind of global dynamics. And that would be a, a mean field model. And then on the right hand side here, we have the, the local terms, which are really, um, which depend on the frequencies in which you get these susceptible infected pairs and whether or not a mutant strain predisposes itself to more of those pairs. We confirm this with simulations. I have no idea how this uh, GIF, it's an ugly GIF regardless. So if you're not seeing it, um, you're not missing out much, but we confirm this with simulations in, in C or C++, depending on what mood you're in, um, just to make sure that our analytical predictions turn up. And kind of the core result I found was that, demonstrated by these four panels here, regardless of ecological circumstance, so degree of host reproduction or castration by pathogens, or degree of dispersal of hosts following birth, under every circumstance, when we increase the mixing of the infection process, so when we allow infection to be not spatially constrained, and we see selection for higher virulence almost universally in every case. And so understanding the kind of theoretical framework here, we can see that a core prediction of spatial theory in determining pathogen uh, virulence is, is robust to a lot of assumptions. Now, this establishes or confirms rather that reducing spatial structuring um, leads to more deadly diseases. So not only does increased movement lead to immediately larger pandemics or more severe per capita infectious diseases, but in the long term, it can increase the severity of an individual infection outcome. So the likelihood that an infected individual will die. Now, why does this matter for bees? Bees are dying, which is why I principally work on them as long as them be, as well as them being extremely cute. And so I'm going to now quickly spend just two or three minutes um, talking about these last two applications of this core principle, where we see changes in honeybee ecology and evolution of infectious diseases across a whole range of scales within individual, within colony, amongst colonies and landscape. We see in America um, features such as this, these are migratory beekeepers moving huge numbers of honeybees across the US in order to pollinate um, large industrial farms, a very different form of beekeeping to what we've seen earlier. Here is a diagram representing the major migratory routes and about 70% of all honeybees in the US end up in Northern California simultaneously, which is a giant mixing event as far as infectious diseases go. And this was reviewed recently by um, some of my co-authors examining or speculating rather on how changing from their evolved feral or native lifestyle A in the top left there to these modern beekeeping practices might have influenced their parasites and pathogens and led to bigger outbreaks and more deadly varieties. Just gonna talk a little bit about some work focusing on this panel here. This is an apiary, this is how we keep bees here adjacent to a sunflower field for pollination service and for honey. And really what I seek to answer is questions like this. Does crowding colonies cause more prevalent diseases in our honeybees? So do beekeepers who pack their apiaries full of livestock experience higher infectious disease burdens? Really this represents industrialization at the apiary scale, partly because it's directly managed by beekeepers, so it's a great thing to work at because we can inform them. It's the actionable recommendations and experimentally viable tests. Uh, it's difficult to know which processes we hone in on, particularly from a pathogen's perspective, but I'm not going to get too far into that today. And this was a manuscript that came out 
um, just over a year ago now that sums this up, if anyone's interested. We built a purely ecological model. I'm not going to talk about the evolutionary analysis today, partly because we really needed the wider pollination biologists kind of determine our ecology to be credible before we did any evolutionary work. It's good pirate work at the single colony, both analytically and computationally. And we looked at APUs like this, distilled them down into diagrams, which to mathematicians uh, look like this. We managed to determine some R0 equations, um, closed form solutions to analytical solutions for these three different shapes. So an array at the top circular and a lattice at the bottom. And from these R0 equations, uh, we can determine how increasing R0 by altering pathogen phenotype increases burden or by changing R0 by increasing the rate at which honeybees mix between colonies um, increases infectious disease burden. Confirmed this with most stochastic stimulations, always a joy when they match up um, like this. Our two models were in good agreement and that allowed us to understand how management um, can change disease burden in the system. We found that the system quickly equilibrates, this matches well to what we see in the field, where regardless of structuring uh, within a single year, typically all, bees, all the bees that are going to be infected um, at any given time become infected. And so we can look at pathogen biology, but more importantly, honeybee ecology, and ask how moving from a very traditional apiary on the left there to a much more industrial apiary on the right, whether or not a beekeeper transitioning between these uh, very traditional compared to industrial sized styles of maintaining their livestock increases their infectious disease burden, which comes back to this core question. What we found was that uh, for any given pathogen, sorry, I just needed to go back there. We can establish a base R0 in the left in the traditional apiary, and then we can look at how much that R0 increases moving to the right into this intensified apiary. We can see that that's determined by how well adapted the pathogen was, even in the traditional style of apiary. This is from stochastic simulations. We found the same result um, from our analytical solutions. And what that gives us is a relationship between R0 and prevalence as well as industrialization and R0, so this change in management. And combining these two pieces of information, we can look at how moving from a very traditional apiary to a much more um, intense, industrially managed apiary will increase the proportion of bees infected, really only increasing uh, percentages by about 15%, far less at maximum, far less than what beekeepers expected, far less than what we expected. and for most honeybee pathogens that we've studied, uh, even less so, they're very, very good at spreading between bees. Um, this was the kind of summative uh, diagram that I get to distribute to beekeepers, demonstrating how modeling, how quantitative ecology can um, underpin predictions about what they need to be concerned about when it comes to their beekeeping, and that really, um, for most honeybee pathogens, crowding isn't very capable of upping infection rates. Managed bees live in such dense societies, if a pathogen gets into a system, it's basically going to expose, every bee is going to be exposed to it, regardless of beekeeper intervention. Um, this has been confirmed by a bunch of molecular methods. Some examples there, looking at viruses which are extremely prevalent. And so that allows us to move on to other parts of epidemiology, which I did wish to talk about, but I'm running up against time. So I think I'm going to close out uh, shortly here. But part three of this was looking at how um, we need to move away from infected versus uninfected paradigms, um, especially talking about insects and honeybees in my case. I think that's a consequence of biases throughout evolution and ecology of infectious diseases. And I don't have any results to present, so you're not missing out on much. But current work is using um, gravity modeling to understand from an empirical perspective how pathogens from different backgrounds exposed to different selection pressures um, determine the severity and the rate of spread of parasites and pathogens in these apiaries. So where we get parasites from matters for how they then behave in a beekeeper's uh, bee yard. And that moves us from talking about binary infection to a severity of infection. And uh, if I just skip forward to my question slide, we have some demonstration there of the kind of things I'm, I'm looking at, differences in different pathogen backgrounds and their rate of spread. And I'm gonna be using some gravity modeling for that, which brings us back to uh, bees in space, my original topic. Um, and with that, if there's time, I'm happy to take one or two questions.
Thank you, everyone.